All right. Welcome to our class. Let's pray to the Lord now. Father, we need help as we think about uh, the issue, transgender issues. Lord, we want to think about it well. We want to think biblically. We want to think in holiness. We want to have a joyful, enthusiastic, full embrace of everything your Bible says in all of its ways, in all of the ways it applies and informs the way we live our lives today. We also want to love our neighbors to the very high degree, the way we unceasingly love ourselves. We want to love our neighbors with that same passion. We want to be compassionate and um, helpful to them. And so, Father, we pray that you'd help us to do that as we think about these things. Thank you that we're not thinking about this in a vacuum, but we're thinking about it as a church family that's trying to make Christ known here in Los Angeles in cooperation with other churches. So guide us, Lord, as we think about these things and as we solidify our thoughts on biblical manhood and womanhood and how it applies to our culture today with the, with the transgender issues and challenge um, that's before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, we are continuing our series on biblical manhood and womanhood. Today we will discuss transgender issues, as I just prayed about, and next week we will discuss same-sex sexuality and the issues um, that pertain to that. So with that being said, I'm going, we're going to recap last week just by starting straight up with the Zoom, I mean with the, um, with the, the statement, um, the Nashville statement. So we'll start with that and we'll go from there um, picking it up. So if you guys could look on your screen, you also have your notes in front of you, hopefully, but you can see here on the screen, um, the Nashville statement, what we'll do here is we'll look at, at it, um, just recapping, and I think we left off on 10 or 11. So beginning with article one of the 2000, was it 2017, Let's see here, yeah, the 2000 Nashville statement. Article one says we affirm that God has designed marriage to be a covenantal sexual procreative lifelong union of one man and one woman as husband and wife and is meant to signify the covenant love between Christ and his bride, the church. We deny that God has designed marriage to be a homosexual, polygamous, or polyamorous relationship. We also deny that marriage is a mere human contract rather than a covenant made before God. Article 2. We affirm that God's revealed will for all people is chastity outside of marriage and fidelity within marriage. We deny that any affections, desires, or commitments ever justify sexual intercourse before or outside marriage, nor do they justify any form of sexual immorality. By the way, that includes fighting pornography as in our church covenant, which is a temptation for many, for most actually men in our day and many women as well. Article three, we affirm that God created Adam and Eve, the first human beings in his own image, equal before God as persons and distinct as male and female. We deny that the divinely ordained differences between male and female render them unequal in dignity or worth. Article four, we affirm that divinely ordained differences between male and female reflect God's original creation design and are meant for human good and human flourishing. We deny that such differences are, are a result of the fall or are a tragedy to be overcome. Article 5, we affirm that the differences between male and female are reproductive structures. Um, I'm sorry. Um, we affirm that the differences between male and female reproductive structures are integral to God's design for self-conception as male and female. So self-conception here is how one understands themselves, right? I think one of the problems with the national statement is self-conception is broad. It could be how one understands himself, but a lot of people, and I think this was part of the questions last week, is how one finds their identity. And even last week with the conversation and the questions, the degree of the, the, the importance of that so-called identity. So I think self-conception is a broad and unclear term in, in the statement. I still agree with it, with, with it if I understood it a specific way. All right, so we deny that physical anomalies or psychological conditions, and we'll talk about that today, nullify the God-appointed link between biological sex and self-conception as male or female. Again, I agree with that depending on what you mean by self-conception. Article six, we affirm that those born with a physical disorder of sex 
development are created in the image of God and have dignity and worth equal to all other image bearers. They are acknowledged by our Lord Jesus in his words about eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb. With all others, they are welcome as faithful followers of Jesus Christ and should embrace their biological sex insofar as it may be known. We deny that ambiguities related to a person's biological sex render one incapable of living a fruitful life in joyful obedience to Christ. I want to say with that, with Article 6 here, and we'll, we'll talk about it in our lesson today, that um, not only are the ambiguities related to a person's biological sex, but even some uh, mental um, tensions and struggles to think of oneself and to feel like a man when you're biologically a man or to feel like a woman. Like if you say, I don't feel like a woman, even though you have, you're biologically a woman, that even with those tensions, um, that doesn't render one incapable of living a fruitful life in joyful obedience to Christ, even if they have those tensions constantly. And um, any questions or comments so far on articles one through six? I know it's a lot and you can read through it again on your own, but any questions or comments that, that popped out at you? Anyone want to say anything? I have a comment. Or a okay. Um, the thing that stood out to you was the where it says eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and the born that way stood out because we've heard that used a lot. Yeah. I was just wondering, in the Bible, is that used specifically for physical? deformities or is it soon that or could it also be if you have same-sex attraction i think it's referring to physical okay yeah that's a good point though because yeah there's even songs born that way right and things like that where yeah good good comment question clarification article seven we affirm that self-conception now here's the idea of self-conception as male or female should be defined by god's holy purposes in creation and redemption as revealed in scripture yeah it should be we deny that adopting a homosexual or transgender self-conception is consistent with God's holy purposes in creation and redemption. So here's where I want to pause and say, if you mean by self-conception that this is your, um, we talked about last week, the identity. If you, if you say I am transgender, and what you mean by that is not only that you have a tension in your mind about the difference between your, your feelings or or thoughts and your, your physical body, but even that it's right to, to just be able to define your, your, your maleness or femaleness apart from the Bible, then, um, then I would say that that is inconsistent with God's holy purposes. And I would even say that having the gender dysphoria or gender confusion is not part of God's holy purposes in creation or redemption. And we know that when we have glorified bodies, we won't struggle with any inordinate desires of, of any kind. Okay, so there won't be that brokenness. But in this world, if you mean by self-conception that I say I have gender dysphoria, like let's just say if I said I feel and think like I, I think I'm a female and I feel like a female, but I know I have a man's body. And, and I acknowledge that, that is part of my struggle and that's just part of who I am in this broken world. If I say that and that's my self-conception, I wouldn't say that that's inconsistent with, with God's holy purposes. So again, th that's where self-conception gets a little bit fuzzy. If you mean by self-conception, I understand myself to have this brokenness, that's a self-conception, but that's not wrong. If you justify that and say it's not brokenness, it is right, um, you know, you, you just scrap God's designs in creation and redemption, then that would be inconsistent in terms of Christian faithfulness. Does that make sense? So self-conception can mean I understand myself to have brokenness, or I understand myself to be this way, and I get to define myself, and I get to push aside or compromise biblical teaching. There's a different, like, so self-conception is wider than what's, um, it's not defined here. And I'm going to take it as the second one because I do agree with the statement if you mean by it the second one. Any questions on that in terms of self-conception? Comments? All right, we're going to Article 8. Just interrupt me. You don't have to wait for me to say a question or comment. Just unmute yourself and start talking. Article 8. We affirm that people who experience same-sex attraction for the same sex may live a rich and fruitful life pleasing to God through faith in Jesus Christ as they, like all Christians, walk in the purity, in purity of life. 
we deny that sexual attraction for the same sex is part of the natural goodness of God's original creation, or that it puts a person outside the hope of the gospel. Nine, we affirm that sin distorts sexual desires by directing them away from the marriage covenant towards sexual immorality, a distortion that includes both heterosexual and homosexual immorality. And you remember Bobby Scott mentioned this last week uh, in our sermon two days ago from 1 Thessalonians 4 about pornea, including, um, you know, he said, homosexuality, so same-sex sexuality, um, fornication, sex before marriage, adultery, sex outside of marriage, self-sex, masturbation. Uh, that's what he mentioned. We could even say bestiality, sex with animals, is also um, a sexual immorality, a distortion. And then you could say, that's on the physical side, then you could even say the thoughts of those things. So pornography, indulging in those things, uh, immodesty, looking up things, especially with the, in the age of smartphones, and, um, and the anonymity. Um, all of those things are distorted desires of a good sexual desire. Good, sexual desire is good. It's God designed. God designed for us to have sexual desire. Um, but it's distorted by sin. We deny that an enduring pattern of desire for sexual immorality justifies sexually immoral behavior. Just because you want it doesn't mean it's right. Okay, Article 10. All right, PJ, can I ask a quick question yep. about Article 8? Yes. Um, so I heard this from a previous pastor that we used to have and he said that there's a debate about um people saying that um it is sinful to have same-sex attraction even if you don't act on it because they're citing james one where it talks about where our sinful desires come from um and i guess i don't know he said that there was some uh gospel coalition australia article that talked about how it's not sinful to have um, same-sex attraction as long as you don't act on it. And I guess he's, he's from the master circle. And I think what he's saying is that's not biblical to have that view. Whereas I think even John Piper would say that, um, you know, SSA doesn't have to be your identity if you're not acting on it. Okay. You added another thing at the end with identity. But let's just, if I could kind of just take that comment out for now, if you want to bring that back in. So yeah, I would disagree with the former pastor and agree probably with, with the Australia, Australian pastors or theologians who said the other. And the reason why I'd say that is um, heterosexual. So there's like, there is a line between temptation and sin. So when, like, I, you know, when I was talking to accountability guys, even just recently, some of the brothers in our church, we were talking about when, when does it, when does a temptation to sin become a sin? And so um, what, what we were talking about in that conversation was how it's not the, the immodest neighbor who's walking by, you know, um, or sister in Christ who's, who's kind of, you know, it's not that. It's, it's not the initial action where if you have an attraction or a desire to look, that's not the sin. It's what you do once, that, once you're confronted with it. So as soon as that comes and I, you know, turn away or close my eyes or just find a way to just avoid my thoughts. So having that in there is not sin in and of itself. It's a temptation to sin. But how I, the first initial response, so do you take a second look or do you just linger there and not look away? So your reaction to the initial action slash desire, that reaction is where the line of sin is, not in having even that desire. Um, for that's true for heterosexual. So even all the married men and all the married women, there's an attraction to your spouse, hopefully, right? But that doesn't mean you're not attracted to the opposite gender in general. That's part of an orderly desire, but it can be disorderly um, when you're married. So um, when those thoughts come, that in and of itself is not a sin yet. It's how you respond. And that's, that could be a split second thing. It's like your initial reaction is where the line of sin would be. So if you have same-sex attraction, so that's on the heterosexual side. If you have same-sex attraction, it's what do you do with when those thoughts and when you're, when you're hit with, when you're met with these temptations? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll think more about your um, married, unmarried example. That might be a good example. But yeah, I, I mean, it was the first time I heard that argument. Which one? The Australia one? Yeah, the one against that, just about the whole James thing, like even the fact that you find the same sex to be like, you're tempted to be attracted to them, that, um, sorry, guys. Yes. 
<laughs> Sorry. Even the fact that you're tempted to be attracted to them is a sinful desire. Yeah, so I would call it an inordinate desire mm -hmm. or disorderly. Mm -hmm. like, like, so as a, as a heterosexual man, if I find a female attractive, that's not inordinate. It's not disorderly, but it can be sinful once I act on it. So, but, but having it, so yeah, I would, I would make a distinction between inordinate desire, disorderly and sinful. Is the person sinning? No, but it's a disorderly desire. And so he, then that, that disorderly desire, that inordinate desire, that, that is a constant desire in his life or her life, that's going to be a, a constant temptation to whatever degree. And so they got to keep fighting it. So that would be the difference between heterosexual and homosexual. It's not, so it's not a one-to-one -one, because one is ordinate, one is inordinate, but it, neither of them are sinful in and of themselves, I would say, until you act on it. One creates, yeah, and they both create different types of sinful temptations, right? Yeah. Thanks. That helps. Okay. We are on Article 10. Um, we affirm that it is sinful to approve of homosexual immorality or transgenderism, and that such approval constitutes an essential departure from Christian faithfulness and witness. Now, what I want to say here is I agree with the statement, and I think it's a strong statement. So it's not just do you do it, but do you approve of it? That, what we're saying is that that's a departure from Christian faithfulness and Christian witness on this point. And I agree with that. But I think transgenderism here, it's so vague, it's vaguely defined again, like self-conception. If, if you mean by that that someone has gender dysphoria and they're fighting it, um, and I approve of them saying, yeah, I have gender dysphoria. And if they call that transgender or transgenderism, actually, they don't even use ism in that way. But if they, if they, call, that, if they call themselves transgender because they have gender dysphoria, not that they think that it's God's orderly design or that, um, that they don't have any moral obligation to resist certain temptations. But if they just call themselves transgender, I wouldn't say, if they, by, by that meaning that they have these inordinate desires, I wouldn't say that they are, um, if someone, if I said, I approve of people calling, I approve of people, let me say it this way. I'll just say for myself, I approve of people who would acknowledge their gender dysphoria and say that they could still follow Jesus. And I would approve of, of it being actual gender dysphoria or gender confusion. And if they called it transgenderism, I would still approve of their, their conception of that. I'm not going to fight about the word, but if they mean by transgenderism that gender doesn't matter or that you could define yourself however you want and God's design is not orderly or um, obligatory or uh, there's no moral oughtness behind it, then I would disagree with them and I'd agree with the statement. Okay, so I agree with the statement as long as they mean by it um, – not just gender dysphoria for someone who's trying to follow Jesus. And I think that's what they mean. I just think it's, it's just, um, it's not tight, tightly defined enough. So it, it risks uh, confusion. On the, the backside, we deny that homosexual or that the approval of homosexual immorality or transgenderism is a matter of moral indifference about which otherwise faithful Christians should agree to disagree. Yep. Yes. And amen to that. Again, just, Granted, how we define transgenderism. Article 11, we affirm our duty to speak the truth and love at all times. And those two words, by the way, brothers and sisters, are so important. Truth in love. So not one or the other, but both of them. Keep them together. Always keep them together. You have a moral obligation to keep those two things together and not jettison one or the other or you'll distort both. So we affirm our duty to speak the truth in love at all times, including when we speak to or about one another as male or female. We deny any obligation to speak in such ways that dishonor God's design of his image bearers as male and female. All right, I'm going to open up a can of worms here that I won't be able to close or satisfy you with. So I'm going to refer you to an article after. What I think they might be getting at here is if someone, if someone prefers a different gender pronoun, so they say, you know, I prefer that you refer to me as she and not as he, even though they're biologically male. What they're saying here is we need to speak the truth in love. And I, I believe that we need to speak the truth in love, but there's a debate of whether we should um, accommodate people who prefer a different gender pronoun or whether we should say, you know, I'm a Christian. I can't accommodate to that because you're biologically male or you're biologically female. Okay. So I want to, um, 
you could, I want to show of hands, thumbs up or thumbs down. If you want to tell me where you're at right now in the discussion at the same time, because this is recorded and it's public. Um, if you don't want to do that publicly again, that's okay. I mean, you're not giving your final answer here. We're going to talk about it now, but if you are, let me just say it this way. If you're for accommodating, if you're for, a, let me, yeah, if you're, well, let me say my position. I don't want to trick you guys here. Okay. Here's where I'm at. I'm at the point where I'm willing to accommodate to somebody's preference of she or he, if I'm allowed to just let them know at the beginning of the conversation that I'm a Christian and that I believe that our biological sex defines or determines our, our, um, our gender. And so I, so if I was talking to a friend who is biologically male, but wants to identify himself as female and say, can you please refer to me as she, when you talk about me, I would say, Hey, for the sake of this conversation, I'm happy to do that to accommodate to you. But I just need you to know from the front that as a Christian, um, I believe that because you're biologically male, that before God and really in reality, you are male, but I will accommodate to you in that. Cause maybe we just disagree and we could, we could, we could argue about it, but I will accommodate to you in the, in the moment. So that's one position. We, is it okay to accommodate? Um, well, I guess there's three positions. One is just accommodate without that explanation. My position, I'm putting kind of in the middle is accommodating, but clarifying that your position, even as you accommodate for the, the remainder of the conversation. And the other side is just don't accommodate at all because that's, that is, um, that's not serving them because you love them in Christ and you don't want to miscommunicate the fact that they're not female when they're saying that they're not female when they say, or they're, when they're saying they are female. So we shouldn't accommodate, accommodate at all. All right. So there's one, two, and three. Okay. Position one, accommodate, no explanation. Position two, explain and accommodate. Position three, don't accommodate because that might miscommunicate truth to them. What position are you? At least right now. We can keep talking about it, you can change, but okay. Five? Oh, two and three. In between two and three? Come on, Jabez, you gotta plant a flag on one side or the other. Three, okay. Uh, anyone else? So I got two two answers. Anyone else want to answer? All right. Okay, I see someone on the chat answering there. All right. Someone trying to dodge the question saying it's hard. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, what's for? Don't accommodate with an explanation. Oh, okay. Okay. Four and three, I'll lump them together. But yeah, I guess we can make it four. I guess we can make that three. And oh, anyways, yeah. Okay. Don't accommodate with an explanation. Anyone else? Four, three. All right, I'm the only one on two. Well, there that is. Anyone want to talk about that at all before we move on? Any questions or you can push me? Johnny said he would explain and avoid all use of pronouns. <laughs> I think I would too. I would too. Yeah. I mean, I, I generally would as well. And really, you don't use third person when you're talking to the person. If I'm talking to T, I'm not like saying she or like, it's just, I'm talking to her. So I'm using you. And uh, unlike Spanish, Spain Spanish, we don't use, um, you know, or I guess that's only for plural. Yeah. I think even in the singular, there is no uh, masculine, feminine, you singular. So all that to say, um, we don't use third person a lot. But I have a friend who would like, let's say in our church, even if like, let's say I was talking to Bethany and then I turn from talking to Bethany and then I start talking to Rita and Christine. And so, yeah, when I was talking to her, referring to Bethany, if Bethany was in within earshot and she heard me referring to her, her as her, I mean, there's someone, you know, in previous church where they would feel hurt and they feel like they're, they're being belittled and like, and almost being smashed, like stepped on, like someone stepping, like this is the way that, this person described it like you're, you're stepping on my heart and it feels like you're attacking me, even though you're not even talking to me. And I just overhear you talking about me. It just hurts really bad. Um, so anyways, so I, yeah, I, I'm on position two. I think before I started this class, I would have been on position three or position four. Um, but yeah, three and four, I'm kind of put lumping together. I don't think you should be three without explanation. That's just mean. Um, so yeah, so position three, I think I would have been with most of you, but I think I'm on position two now to accommodate to them. And I think that's what we do with, with um, other non-Christians when we engage them. So if I'm talking to a Roman Catholic 
and he keeps referring to himself as a Catholic. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say, I don't really think you're Catholic, because I don't think they're Catholic. I think that they are not part of the universal church because they're under the Bishop of Rome. I think they're sectarian, and I think it's a false church. But like if someone's ta- calling themselves a Catholic, I'm not going to comp- I'm not going to say, you know what, I can't refer to you as a Catholic because I don't really think you're universal. I'm just going to, I could accommodate with, I could be like, yeah, I don't think the church is a true church, but I could accommodate the language for the sake of this conversation. So I think the way I would have, I normally do that with Catholics. I think in a similar way, I, I would do, I could do that. And I, I would do that with someone who is identifying as a different, with a different gender pronoun. All right, questions or comments, pushback? Um, something I'm thinking through too is like, your level of relationship with the person already. Um, like obviously that'd be, yeah. it'd be easier to stick to not using those pronouns if you already have a good relationship with them and they could understand where you're coming from. But like my sister works in the hospital and she's had transgender patients and you're only gonna see them one time, two times. And do you, what she's basically decided to do is use their preferred pronouns in that moment because there's no time to have a conversation. Yeah. It would be offensive. And right, so right. that's something I'm still processing too. Like how, how many times are you going to see them? Are you going to be able to develop a relationship with them or not? Right. And I would call that, I, I think one of the terms that I've heard used, I can't remember who said it. I don't think it was Andrew Walker. Andrew Walker wrote an ERLC article on it. I can't remember his conclusion, but I'll send that to you guys after. But um, someone said, I think it was Ryan, Ant- no, I don't know who, but someone said hospitable accommodation. You know, when you're hospitable to someone and you don't know them that well, you kind of defer to some things and you're not going to fight about every inch of conversation. And so I think I would, I would affirm what your sister's point is there. It's, it's similar to saying like, you know, gospel intentionality. I had someone who was um, an Orthodox Jew come over to our house recently as we've been thinking through different contractors for for something here at the church uh, parsonage. And I wanted to share the gospel with him. And we were talking about different things. And I was like, should I share with it now? But he might be our contractor. I'd love to continue to build a friendship with him. So I ended up not sharing with him. And I think there are some ways where he might have thought that I'm affirming things that I don't affirm. And I didn't say I affirmed them, but I think he could have understood it that way. And I didn't think I needed to clarify in that conversation that I disagree with him stronger than I did. Um, because I'm accommodating to to that conversation. So yeah, uh, Bethany, thanks for that illustration. I, th- I think I think your sister. I mean, I would affirm if I was her pastor, I'd just affirm her like I think you're fine. I think that's that seems to me to be the wisest thing to do in that situation. But yeah, Christians disagree on that. So I, I want to bring up in this class because you'll find Christians who might say that's unfaithful, or that's not speaking the truth in love. And I want to create space in our church for people to to be able to to have that conclusion without compromising biblical manhood and womanhood, or even shirking away from it. Okay? Interrupt me if you want to keep going. Article 12. We affirm that the grace of God in Christ gives both merciful pardon and transforming power, and that this pardon and power enable a follower of Jesus to put to death sinful desires and to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. We deny that the grace of God in Christ is insufficient to forgive all sexual sins, and we deny that the grace of God is insufficient to give power for holiness to every believer who feels drawn into sexual sin. I like that idea, giving power for holiness to every believer. But you must not understand giving power for holiness as being able to destroy or completely eliminate the desire. It can happen, but it could also not happen. Okay, do you guys get that? Like God is powerful to destroy a desire, but God might not destroy that desire. Does that make sense to, to you guys? Okay. Just like I would say to someone in a different sense, um, God is powerful to heal someone from cancer, but he's also, he'll also, he's also fully powerful to make somebody holy in the cancer without healing them. And so in a similar way. Okay. That's an analogy, not an identity. Okay. Article 13. We affirm that the grace of God enables, or the grace of God in Christ enables sinners to forsake transgender self-conceptions. And again, I mean, I think they mean by that, to say that I am a different gender and that's right. And that's before God, it's fully pleasing to God. I think if you mean by that uh, gender dysphoria, I disagree, but I don't think that's what they mean here. Enable sinners to forsake transgender self-conceptions and by divine forbearance to accept the God-ordained link 
between one's biological sex and one's self-conception as male and female. I just really hate the way that self-conception is so vague in this document, but I get it. We deny that the grace of God in Christ sanctions self-conceptions that are at odds with God's revealed will. Okay. Article 14, we affirm that Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners and that through Christ, through Christ's death and resurrection, forgiveness of sins and eternal life are available to every person who repents of sin and trusts in Christ alone as Savior and Lord and Supreme Treasure. We deny that the Lord's arm is too short to save or that any sinner is beyond his reach. Amen and amen. Okay, any comments on this? I do want to move into talking about some trans, uh, transgender um, a transgender issue and introduce, su summarize the, the lectures I sent to you guys by email last week. Any questions here? All right. This was um, a, three lectures and I sent you guys this PDF. Um, this is by the name of this brother? Can't remember his name right now. And it's not on here. Oh yeah, Mark Yarhouse. This is by brother Mark Yarhouse. He's a, an elder at a local church and he's a psychologist. So he gives three lectures, um, the foundational considerations, scientific, biological, psychological, and social, socio-cultural considerations, and then a pastoral response. So I don't want to go through the Bible part because that's basically our biblical manhood and womanhood. Um, you could listen to the lecture because it's really good and really helpful, but I won't take the time to go through that now. Um, hmm. Let me do it this way. I'm going to change screens here for a second. So hold on. I'm going to send you guys this article that I'm about to post or show you here on my screen. Let me share from my laptop. So this is from a, a book on Christian worldview. This is my Kindle book here. Can you guys see is gender choice? You guys see that there on your screen? Yes, thumbs up. Yeah, okay, good. So here, um, here you'll see is gender choice. Um, but I want to I want to show you something here. So biological here here. Are, um, the biological components of sex resolve into four facets. Okay. So think about these four things, because I'm going to, we're going to show seven different, seven different categories and where the confusion can happen. So defining sex, sex, um, sex and gender chromosomes with the prototypical male having one X and one Y chromosome and the female having two X chromosomes. Okay. So there's the DNA, then gonads and the hormones that, pr that they produce with males having testes and females ovaries. Okay, so there's a physical part. Third, sexual anatomy with male external structures, including the penis and scrotum and internal structures, including, I don't know how to say that, vas deferens and prostate, while females externally have a clitoris and labia and internal structures, including the vagina, uterus, and fallopian tubes. Okay, so two and three are talking about, well, one's talking, so DNA, hormones, and now sexual uh, physical appearance and uh, physical organs. And then four, um, secondary sex char characteristics, including for males, denser, coarser body hair, body and facial hair, larger stature and greater muscular mass, while females manifest in large breasts, wider hips, less body hair, and less muscle mass. Okay? So those are all physical things. You guys following so far? Yes? DNA, hormones, physical appearance, and then secondary uh, physical characteristics. Now, then there's the psychological, cultural complements of gender resolve into at least three separate facets. Okay, so you got those four, and then you got these three. Gender identity. So it's the subjective sense of being a man or a woman. Do you feel like a man or a woman? So there's the gender, the subjective sense. What do you feel like? Then there's sexual orientation with the prototypical male experiencing only erotic attraction to females and females to males. So sexual orientation, uh, where, where are your sexual desires seek, seeking to be completed? Okay. And then third, so one is your, your feeling. The second one is your sexual desires. And the third here is your gender role. The person's adoption of cultural expectations for maleness, masculinity, or femaleness 
femininity. And this is what we've been talking about, that number three is really what we've been really working on in our biblical manhood and womanhood class because we've been assuming all the others, right? We've assumed one through four on the body, and we've assumed one and two here on the psychological. And so our whole class, before we start talking about this topic, was really number three. How do you think biblically, how do we define number three biblically and live that out? So we talked about what is mature masculinity and what is mature femininity, not only culturally, but even biblically informing our current culture. All right. So let me just read on in um, Stanton Jones article here. Given the complexity of the seven factors in their development, it is remarkable that so many adults al align consistently on all seven factors, thus experiencing somewhat an uncomplicated, a somewhat uncomplicated sense of being a man or a woman. But some individuals, now here's where we need compassion and biblical Christian ministry, okay? So pay attention here. Some individuals deviate from the norms in one or more of the seven areas, as the following examples illustrate. So here are seven deviations. Some individuals inherit extra chromosomes, XXY and XXYY conditions with attendant complications. So you got DNA complications because of the brokenness of sin and the fall. Um, not personal sin, but just sin in the world and the fall. Two, some experience incomplete gonad development and others develop gonads of mixed testicular and ovarian issues. So true hermaphroditism. Three, so these are the physical ones, right? Uh, th that was the hormone. Now, number three is um, the physical outside and interior. Malfunctioning gonads or a hormonally abnormal uterine environment may result in problematic anatom anat anat anatomical? anatomical. Did I say that right, Christine? Okay. Development, androgen insensitivity syndrome, micro penis, ambiguous genitalia such as enlarged clitoris and labia that are mistaken upon birth as a penis and scrotum that are sometimes called intersex conditions. Further environmental events may create problems, a botched circumcision that amputates a penis. Okay, those are all physical things. Number four, hormonal problems can result in minimized or exaggerated secondary sex characteristics. Remember, we were talking about a broader stature, bigger muscles, smaller, slender, those types of things. Okay, those are all on the physical side. Now, five, six, and seven, remember, are the psychological aspects. Certain individuals report emphatic gender identification in contrast with their biological sex. Okay, so, so here, that's where we're talking about self-conception. And what, we want, what, I, what I'm trying, what I wanna say is that there is a brokenness on one through four, but also on five. You could have one through four okay, but you could have an emphatic, an emphatic gender dysphoria or confusion or a, a strong subjective sense that you're not what your body tells you you are, or what your body shows that you that shows you that you are. That's number five. Number six, three to five percent of the population report consistent, stable erotic attraction orientation toward persons of the same sex or to both sexes in varying degrees. Others report stable attractions in the other directions, in other directions like pedophiles. That was brought up in an example last week. So again, that would be a distortion, or what we were calling earlier an inordinate desire. There but that can, some people have consistent erotic attraction in those inordinate directions. And then number seven, some individuals are drawn to gender atypical roles. Further, cultures vary widely in their prescribed gender roles, including their clarity and rigid, rigidity. So we, girls play with dolls and like pink, and boys like blue and like to wrestle. Like Those are some cultural things that Different cultures have different, I just gave you some cultural things there, but different cultures have different things, and that varies widely, and some people align on all six, but then they like to um, do things that in their culture are more boyish, even though they're a girl, or vice versa. And so we might call boys effeminate or girls tomboys, at least that's what they did in my school growing up when I was in elementary and junior high. And so that's not on any of the one through six, but on number seven. So do you guys see here um, the seven, these, these layers of the way now it's amazing how many of us are aligned up on all seven and that's just what we would call quote unquote normal um and so when we see those who aren't we might be so quick to say oh you're sinning well with one through four i mean these one through four on these physical attributes we're not going to say that they're sinning five is trans is the transgender issue that we're talking about six is the same sex attraction issue and then seven is more cultural roles and things like that so I hope these, these seven things kind of give us a, a context for us, a grid 
to start to think about the issue. Any questions or comments on this? On these seven? I'm gonna send this, this article to you just so you guys have it. Questions or comments? All right, I am going back to this, this other thing because I, I do want to talk about ministry on how, on how, to, um, how to think about these things, at least to get our, our church family to, to, um, to minister more faithfully as Christians. So what I want to focus on is that number five, which is that subjective sense of feeling that you're a different gender than what your body tells you you are, okay? This is what we might call gender incongruence. So in gender incongruence, there are three, these three blocks are different aspects to a person's life. Okay. So gender incongruence, that top one is just like what, what people think gender is, what it's defined as on the, the transgender community. You see there on the bottom left, that's a community that's going to take someone who has gender dysphoria and say, Oh, you're transgender. That's why come with us. Right. We love you. We accept you. And sadly, a lot of people on the local faith church community side, are gonna see someone with gender dysphoria and say, what, you're sinning. Why would you think that? Stop thinking that. You're not accepted in our church if you feel that way. You need God's grace and God's grace can change you. And if God's grace doesn't change you and you still feel like you're the opposite gender than you are, then you're not a Christian or you're not repenting. And so what happens is when, they, when, they, when these people are facing gender dysphoria or gender con confusion and incongruence, they're accepted readily and cheered and celebrated by, their trans, by the transgender community. And, in, and my, did you guys hear that? My girls are screaming, it's probably a spider or something. I was just checking if that's a real scare. No, I think it's fine. Okay, um, but you guys see how this could hurt our church family or at least people in our church? Like if someone feels that gender incongruence and if we're just going to say that you know that you're, we're gonna we're, we're gonna reject them outright for feeling that, or 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 struggling so long and not making quote any quote unquote progress in their subjective sense, while while they're being celebrated by the other side, then um, it's no it's no um, mystery why so many people reject the church or leave the church when they really want to follow Jesus perhaps and they're just they just need a church family to really rally around them and understand them and minister to them and walk with them for as long as it takes for them to fight sin, which might be the rest of their lives as we're all fighting sin for the rest of our lives, right? So, um, so yeah, so those are, those are the dynamics here. Um, we don't know quite what causes gender incongruence. Just like when we look through that list of seven, there can be a lot of different things that cause it. And if you just say, well, it's sin. Well, I mean, sin in general, there's a brokenness to this world, yes. But if you say, oh, because the person is sinning, that might not be the case. You know, I think what, how they respond to it, that's where we want to hold people accountable to all of us in all the way we respond. How any of us responds to sinful temptation, that's where we need to hold each other accountable and walk with each other and help each other. But to have the temptation or to have the confusion is not in and of itself a sin. And if we assume, well, it's because you're sinning, then we're not going to be able to love them in the truth because we're assuming something that's, that, that might not be accurate. Um, he, um, Mark Yarhouse encourages us to take a lifespan developmental perspective. So what he means is like, if you meet, if I meet someone in their forties who has uh, gender dysphoria or feeling gender incongruence, what I should do as a pastor, what Mark Yarhouse is recommending is PJ, if you're a pastor in his lecture, he says, you should sit down with the person. This is what he does. He'll sit down with them and say, Hey, it's great to meet you. It's a privilege to meet you. I'm pro I feel like I'm coming in on like chapter five of your life. Can you take me through chapters one through four? And just help me to, to understand your story and how you are and who you are and, you know, the, just how you've developed and where, where you've come from and what brought you to where you are today. And he was saying that he's a, he says, I guarantee most transgender people or people struggling with gender dysphoria haven't had a pastor sit down with them and just say, hey, tell me your story. I'd love to just hear it and, and, and like and think with you and, and understand you better in light of it. So um, he just talks about how most people estimate 75% who um, have gender dysphoria, it's resolved by adulthood. So you just kind of, you don't like, sometimes parents overreact and they'll say like, oh, you know, 
you know, you can't be transgender or you, you're not a, you're, you're a boy, you're a boy. And so they might force something on their kids in a way that, you know, 75% of the time, it, they're going to be fine. Just like, you know, just keep loving them and, and, and bringing them through. But there's that issue. Okay. You guys can listen to the lecture because there's way more here and we're like over time almost. Um, let's see. What does my gender experience of gender dysphoria mean to me? They're going to need biblical truth. They're going to need the church family to um, celebrate their humanity, that they are made in God's image, that they're loved and that they're made. In, and that if they're Christian, that they love Jesus Christ, they're, they're going to need us to celebrate them in who they are while at the same time, understanding their struggle and fighting sin in their life as we fight sin in our own life and invite them to help us fight sin in ours. Uh, he talks about different purposes of cross-dressing. Some are sinful. I mean, you know, there's just different things here, expression management. You guys can listen to that. It's really helpful. I just want to, let me, um, let me go to his main point. Sorry, I got to scroll through all this. Okay, so there's, he has three perspectives here, three, three frameworks. The integrity framework is what you've been taught from the Bible, that we are one person. So all seven of those things line up, right? Your, your biology, your DNA, your hormones, your secondary characteristics, your subjective sense of identity, your sexual attraction, and the secondary um, or the cultural expressions. All of that lines up for most of us. And so we say that they should all be united in integrity. And we should, and they should be, actually. That's our argument with biblical manhood and womanhood. So that's a Christian teaching, and we should keep teaching that and not compromise on that. Yet, we should understand the disability side of it. This is someone who identifies sexual identity issues and gender dysphoria as a reflection of normal variation in nature. For Christians, it is at times like to a disability, a non-moral non reality to be addressed with compassion. So if someone has a disability, you don't, um, you don't just, I'm not ignoring the moral implications of temptation like we talked about earlier, but when someone has a struggle or disability, you don't write them off right away. Um, like if I had a broken arm or if someone has cancer and they're dying of cancer, you don't just say like, like this is what the prosperity, health, wealth, and uh, you know, that's what they'll say is like, you don't have enough faith. That's why you're dying. So that's what they would say to someone who's dying of cancer. Your problem is you don't have enough faith in Jesus. If you did, you'd be healed. And the way we would look at that and say, like, don't say that to people. That's so unhelpful. That's sinful. That's just wrong to say that to people, right? That's what we would say. Um, if it's just a lack of faith, that's why you're not being healed, healed of cancer. But a lot of times with gender dysphoria or same-sex attraction, we do a similar thing and write it off as if it's just that they don't have enough faith in Jesus. Or that, and, and not see that it could actually be some brokenness that's not just a mere lack of exercising faith. Sorry, my wife is calling me. But, um, okay. Yeah, so, so that's, oh, I lost my screen share here. Give me a sec. You guys can interrupt me with a question while I get the share, share back up. Hmm. Okay, wait, Jabez, you're, wait, hold on, Jabez. So the diversity one, hmm. let me go back here. Uh, strong forms of deconstruction. Now, this is where the culture goes. And they'll say, let's deconstruct sex, gender as oppressive. Um, so the, uh, that's a strong form. Like, and that's where you see the LGBT movement going, right? Let's sell, so let's reject integrity. It's not a disability. It's not brokenness. It's diversity. So let's deconstruct the way that culture thinks about gender. And we are not doing that. That's what our whole biblical manhood, womanhood class is about, is to not deconstruct that. But the weak form of diversity is it highlights sexual identity and gender identity issues as reflecting an identity and culture to be celebrated as an expression of diversity. So maybe not deconstruct everything as oppressive, but let's celebrate it. Okay. So that would be the diversity perspective or the diversity lens. Now, Mark Yarhouse is saying we should embrace all three in some ways, not in the same way. Okay. So the integrity one is the biblical teaching, right? You guys, that's what we've been doing with manhood and womanhood. The integrity one is biblical teaching of normal, ordinate, righteous manhood and womanhood. Disability, we should be able to, to understand as Christians because we understand that we're in a fallen world and broken world and that our lives are broken. So we shouldn't have a problem understanding the disability piece of it, and we should be able to have compassion in light of it. And then the diversity one, while rejecting deconstruction and even rejecting celebrating inordinate desires. We should not do that. We should not approve of inordinate desires or gender dysphoria in terms of it being a righteous thing. We should celebrate the person as a Christian in the sense that we love them or even as a human, if they're not a Christian, 
that they are made in God's image, that they are valuable, and that we do love them, and that they do express God's glory in the way that they look and live as humans. And so they need to be affirmed in their humanity, but not the strong form or weak form here. So what Mark Earhouse would say is, brothers, sisters, Christians, pastors, we should understand these aspects and take all the strengths from all of it. And they're not three equal lenses, but we should take them and minister to people faithfully in light of, of these realities. All right. Um, there's a lot more I could say. You guys could listen to the lectures, but let's talk for the rest of our time. Questions, comments, thoughts. Jabez. Uh, no, I, yeah, I don't have a question. I'm still just thinking. Okay. I have a question. Okay. Um, so, like, with the disability category, yeah. um, so I, I mean, obviously I'm not for, like, strong arming people into a sin or no sin category, but the disability category, like, I understand it in terms of, like, um, I guess more anecdotally, right, from people. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I guess, like, the danger that I, I'm trying to guard against is um, turning everything into a disability. Like, someone could say, well, I just get a thrill. I was born with a thrill to, like, steal. Or I was born where I just have an inclination towards... Um, alcoholism or you know things like that and i mean you could there's anything within that spectrum of things that would be biblically categorized as sin yeah that um i mean i guess even with those I, we could apply it in the same way where as long as they're not acting on it it's not sin but i guess um i don't know like i'm trying to guard against like the danger of people just kind of throwing out any sin issue and turning it into like a disability. Like, well, I'm just, that's just the way I am, you know, like. Yeah. I think, I think that's a legitimate fear, especially in our culture where they're trying to celebrate the diversity lens in that strong form or weak form where they, they don't have moral bearings, biblically moral bearings. So I understand that fear. I think it's legitimate to you. So I, I think you're right to have that. It's just what, what I'm trying to do in this class is to teach you to not let that fear push you in the wrong direction. Because oftentimes when we fear something legitimately, if we fear it too much and we're not able to kind of keep our bearings, we could swing a pendulum in, in a wrong way and not love somebody well. So what I'm trying to do is um, center you, center, the, center, our, center our church with a full orb understanding. I'm not backing away from anything from the Nashville statement as we explained it, or even the biblical manhood and woman class. We just spent so many weeks defining it so carefully and so controversially, even among Christians, right? In terms of complementarianism. And I haven't backed away from what we said about complementarianism. So given all that as context, um, we need to, yeah, be aware that people don't make excuses for sins, but I think that's, if you're coming from a conservative Christian background like I am, then the default is going to be to, to um, not, I don't think we're gonna have problems on the integrity lens. You know, I think our problem is gonna be more on the disability or the diversity lens of actually um, trying to take something from it to helpfully serve people. Because I think if you talk about alcoholism, if someone was, you know, if a kid was born to heroin addicts or heroin at addicted mom and has an addiction to heroin, we wouldn't blame them morally for that, you know, as a kid. But so, but there's brokenness there. Or your other one, because you're, you said stealing or thrill. I would even say with thrill, like we are made for thrill. We're made to take risks. We're made to do something great with our lives. And so um, it's always like, the, it's, it's basically the Christian yes, but answer. Where is God's common grace? God's design in something. There's a design to have thrill. There's a, there is an enemy to conquer. There are risks to be taken, you know, and, and um, but, but there's also wrong ways you could, you could exercise that in sin, like, like stealing. I think there's less moral ones, like making it a habit of like, I'm not, again, I don't think skydiving is a sin. I think it's stupid. I don't think it's a sin though. But um, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get mad at my kids if they, like, I'd probably get mad at them, but I wouldn't say they're sinning if they, if they went skydiving. I would just think, there are real way. There are real thrills in life. Like I mean, like real. Like there are real risks to take in relationships, in gospelizing, in missions. Like there are so many real things to find a risk in. That I understand that you have. You're built for it. But if you're gonna live your life just you know thrill seeking on all these cheap ways, then um, 
you're going to kind of miss seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So I don't want to ever throw away the baby out with the bathwater on thrills or on, you know, someone who's addicted to alcohol, you know? So um, it's all, it's similar to ethnocentric oppression in some ways. And even, even what we're talking about with the poor, if you remember when we're talking about poverty, there's like four aspects that cause poverty. It's not just one. There's personal behavior, which is the sin issue, but there's also unrighteous people who are exploiting. And then there's unrighteous systems, oppressive systems. So it's not like a person intentionally doing it, but there's systems of cultural patterns and the way that works and that crushes somebody. And then there's demonic oppression. So those four things are always in play in the, with the poor or with, um, you know, when we're talking about ethnocentric oppression towards African-Americans, for example, it's not just, so conservatives like to, like to emphasize personal behavior. Liberals like to, like to emphasize oppressive systems. But if you're a Christian, you can't get caught up in partisan or, you know, political talking points at the end of the day. You need to go to the Bible first before you engage in these issues. And so um, I would say the same thing here um, with this to you. It's like, yes, let's not compromise on the moral behavior. Let's not use disability as an excuse for sin, but let's define sin accurately. And I think when you've been taught from that one pastor that having the desire in and of itself is automatically sin all the time, I think that's an oversimplification. I think that's actually not reading the situation right to love people correctly. So would you say that pretty much any sin could be in the disability category? Any sin? I would say that any sin we, I, I would say this, the, it depends what you mean by disability. So let me, let me broaden disability first. No, if you're talking about like biological disability. Okay. But if you mean by disability, like things outside themselves, things outside of the person, like it is a sin only someone's personal behavior. I would say almost never, but, it, but we still hold them responsible for their personal behavior. But um, there's a brokenness in the world. Like I, am, I have a sin nature because Adam ate the fruit, right? I didn't eat the fruit in the Garden of Eden, but I was born with a sin nature and I'm responsible for how I act given my sin nature. I can't use my sin nature as an excuse. At the same time, I can't act like I don't have a sin nature. If I'm going to rebuke one of our church members, I can't act like they don't have a sin nature affected by Adam. That's something outside of themselves that they were born into. That doesn't take away any personal responsibility or accountability. But so that would just be a general thing. In that sense, there's, a, there's an outside disability, you could say, or there's an outside force that's pressing on them. That's not an excuse to sin where there's personal responsibility, but don't confuse the two and act as if there is no outside forces uh, given, you know, there's, so there's the world, the flesh and the devil, right? Just to use the, the three common ones, but then you still make, so if someone's sinning, I'm not going to discount those three, um, as real effects on the situation. And if you want to call that disability, I mean, I could call that a disadvantage if you like, or just, um, environmental pressure, you could say that's outside of them, outside of their personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to factor that in when we, um, when we engage people on this issue and on other issues too. Yeah, that's helpful. Maybe I just like the, them using the word disability just makes me think of a certain thing. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean like, so I would just, just to go very briefly here, cancer, yeah. like, you know, if that's disabling you from being able to walk and talk and stuff like that, cause you're dying that there's no moral, there's no inordinate aspect to that. Right. But gender dysphoria or same-sex attraction, um, there is, there, there's an inordinate desire there. And I think maybe that inordinate part is the key, the kind of the middle lane between it's sin or disability. That inordinate desire there being something. So if I see someone with an inordinate desire or inordinate subjective sense of their gender, I'm not going to, I'm going to ask a lot more questions before I just say, you know, how dare you have that desire? You should never show your face in our church or something like that, which is what sometimes um, other, other churches have done. Have you guys seen the Dear Church video that I sent to you guys yesterday? Did you guys get an email? Dear Church, a Vimeo video? Okay, I encourage you guys to watch that video. I, there's only one sentence in that whole video, 20 minutes, that I disagree with. But other than that, it really is getting conservative churches to just think about what the way that they approach this question. It's just people who have same-sex attraction, how parents, gender dysphoria, and just some horror stories about like what they've been told by parents. It's not mean or anything, but it's just, it's a real way of like, hopefully it elicits compassion from you. I mean, it, it brought me and Francis like to tears almost in just how, how the struggle is and how many churches 
including myself. I don't think I pastored well in this. I'm, I feel like I'm learning as I've been like the last three weeks because of our biblical manhood and womanhood. I feel like I've even grown in my um, ability to pastor people, particularly on, on, with a transgender issue. Um, yeah. And hopefully our church can, can kind of go into that light um, as a church because a lot of those Christians or would be Christians who are struggling with it don't have a lot of churches they can go to who are prepared to, to serve them. I have one more question. Okay. Wait, hold on. Uh, just before you go, Tia. Anyone else? So I got Tia, just kind of like last round to so just raise your hand. If you have a question, we'll just make this the final call for questions or comments. Anyone besides Tia want to comment or question? Okay, Bethany, anyone else? Going once, checking my chat. There's no one on the chat. All right, Tia and then Bethany, last two. Um, so, you know, coming from more conservative church backgrounds or some of my churches have been conservative, like they're always gonna ask for like, okay, so you're talking about inordinate desires versus sin. Like where in the scripture is there an example of that? Or like where in scripture does it refer to that? Or is this just more like, that's not like scripture and verse kind of thing? Um, okay, let's go to James. Cause you, you talked about James, right? So I'm taking my Bible out here. James chapter one, it says, uh, no one undergoing trial should say I'm being tempted by God since God is not tempted by evil and he himself doesn't tempt anyone. That's verse 13, James 1, 14. But each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to what? Sin. To sin. Okay. So, so the, the evil desire, and he calls it evil desire. We're calling it inordinate desire. Evil is a little bit of a stronger word. But evil desire is not sinning yet. Okay? It's when that evil desire conceives, okay? When it conceives, then it gives birth to sin. But you can have an evil desire that doesn't conceive and give birth to sin yet. So in order to desire, you could, you could call it evil desire. A desire that is not according to the goodness of God's creation design. So if I'm tempted with a adulterous desire, um, if I, if I, if that's an evil desire, if that conceives in me and I let, I don't fight that temptation, it becomes a sin. It gives birth to sin. And so evil would be defined as according to God's goodness and holiness. So inordinate as well, the order or the orderliness or disorderliness, the evil or goodness of a desire is defined by God's word, but that's not sinning yet in and of itself. At least in James 1, 14. Because James 1, he is going step by step. He's giving a step process, right? Anything else, Tia, on that? Or pushback or comments, questions? I do, but it's going to take too long. So I'll just continue that conversation later. But that's all. Right. all. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Bethany. Um, no, just real quick, because I did watch the video that you sent. And... I was curious what you disagreed with. I don't know if you want to say it now, but. Sure. There was a part where uh, one of the sisters said, um, it's around the 15 minute mark. I, I even marked the time because I wanted to make sure, but I wanted you guys to watch it first. Um, where she says that God is the perfect ex expression of male and female. And I was like, ah, Christ and the church are the perfect expression of male and female. But when you say God, like the triune God is the perfect expression of male and female. I was like, no, no, he's not. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not the perfect expression of male and female. I think, they, I think the Son submitting to the Father, like that expresses things that, that a wife does in marriage. But I don't think, yeah. So I just thought that was, it was, it was too strong. She was getting riled up though at that point too. Like she was like kind of preaching at that point. And so like, I could understand the emotion of it, but I just thought it was, it was an overstatement. Yeah. But I encourage you guys to watch that video. Um, I'm going to, I don't know if I should post a link here, but yeah, check the email. If you don't have that email, maybe Rita, I'm not sure if you're on the, the church, the, it's not the church email. It's the BBC manhood womanhood class email. So I'm not sure if you're on it. Cause there's those who are in the class from the beginning, but if you guys want, I'll, I'll probably, I guess I'll send to the whole church. I don't know. I actually know. Hmm. I don't want to send to the whole church cause they haven't had this conversation that we're having. And so I just don't know if they're going to get it right away. 
So my mom is saying absolutely not. Mom, did you watch the video? If you could send it to me, I don't have it. Okay, you didn't. Okay, well, you guys watch the video. Mom, watch the video first. Javez, tell me if you think I should send it to the whole church or not. I think it's a helpful video, but um, watch it first. Bethany, do you think I should send it to the whole church? Um, I don't know. I think it could be okay. I Well, I don't know. I've been in the class, so I don't know where I would have been beforehand, but. You should try it on Chris. Okay. Try it on Chris. Tell me what he thinks. Um, cause he has Someone email it to me. Yeah. I'll email it to the, I'll email to you and Rita. Um, yeah. So I'll email to you. I think even though if I haven't watched yet, I think sending it would be fine. Just as long as you give like a preface of like, this is what we've been talking about in biblical manhood and kind of just giving like a quick snippet of like why you are sending it. Yeah. Yeah. That's helpful. It's just good if you have time to answer a bunch of questions after. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna. Let, should I? Can I stop recording though? Okay, I'm gonna stop recording because there's um, one other thing I want to say, but I don't want to record either. Let me pray and then I'll stop recording. And then if you guys got to go, you got to go. Father, thank you for this class. Thank you for letting us at least start to breach the topic of um, transgender issues. Lord, we want to love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, even those who have gender dysphoria and those who are confused and those who feel like they're not affirmed as humans. Uh, we want to love our neighbors well. We want to speak the truth in love. We don't want to just love in a non, in an unbiblical, undefined, crossless, Christless way. But we want to love well. So God, guide us. We need your wisdom to do this. Statements by themselves don't love the persons around us. So make us a church that does that more and more. And bless this class as we think about these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.